darkness. Only ambition will guide you. Your freedom will be the wars you wage. Your entitlement, the pain you endure. And when darkness finds you, you will face it alone. In Stellaris, an origin represents the background of a species before it managed to unify itself into an empire. There are many different unique origins that all give us some fantastic backstories to our empires in Stellaris. But how powerful are these origins and which ones are better than others? In this video I am going to try to answer that question by putting the origins into a tier list. I will be looking at it from both a multiplayer and a single player perspective and it is really important to remember that context is very very different. Some games you might start with lots and lots of lovely habitable worlds around you and that might improve a certain start and other games you may not have the same situation so I've tried to be as objective as I can be in this list. Let's dive in to this Origins tier list. As always, we are going to start right at the bottom with the F tier. Now, the origins in this tier are here, generally speaking, because they have some sort of detriment, or I really don't feel the bonus is useful at all. Galactic Doorstop lets your empire start with a dormant gateway in its initial solar system. Over the years, you're going to get some events happening from this gateway. You're going to get between 100 and 1500 alloys and or minerals. A small space amoeba will come through and that one is actually quite annoying if you don't have a navy because that space amoeba can do quite a bit of damage and a special project that will create the from gateway sent archaeological site. The archaeology site is going to give you some minor artifacts between 1 to 5 for every stage and it will also give you a very 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 small amount of physics and engineering research. When you finally manage to reactivate the gateway you will unlock the gateway construction technology. You won't have it instantly researched but you will have it unlocked. So the only really saving grace here is that because you have a mega structure in your empire, the gateway, you will have an increased chance of rolling the mega engineering technology and you'll also be automatically guaranteed to roll the gateway construction technology but those benefits come so much later into the game that it's basically like playing without an origin. Slingshot to the Stars is the first origin we're going to see that's come from the new Stellaris Overlord DLC and in order to use this origin you will need to have the Overlord DLC. This origin gives a minus 75% star place influence distance cost. You will start with a ruined quantum catapult megastructure in a neighboring system and you will also get the quantum catapult archaeology site in that system. Now this archaeology site is going to give you a nice amount of research, mainly engineering research, and at the end of the chain you'll get a 50% increase to your megastructure build speed. This is not a permanent modifier, that will modifier will expire after a certain amount of time so it is best not to complete this archaeological site until you are ready to fully repair the ruined quantum catapult. Now when we're talking about this quantum catapult, one of the new megastructures from Overlord, you will be able to repair it without the mega engineering technology and without any actual technology you just need two and a half thousand alloys. At this first upgraded level it will have some rudimentary range and quite a large scatter. Now you can fully upgrade it for another 15,000 alloys but that does require the mega engineering technology. And all of that comes at the cost of getting one less guaranteed habitable world. Now if you don't run with any guaranteed habitable worlds this shouldn't be that much of an issue. However I generally run with two guaranteed habitable worlds so from that point of view I think this is a massive drawback having 33% less in the way of habitable planets right at the start of the game. And whilst the quantum catapult is a nice and fun mega structure, I don't think it really justifies that sort of investment, especially in the early game. As the strategic benefits here aren't that great, it's mostly a bit of a gimmick. Common Ground requires that you own the Federation's DLC. You start with the Diplomacy Tradition tree adopted and with the Federation Tradition unlocked. 
And you need that because you're going to start in a federation as the president of a galactic union with two other members. These two members will be xenophile and share at least one other ethic with the president. But you'll get no guaranteed habitable worlds, and that is regardless of any game setting. You'll also get a nice plus 100 permanent opinion modifier to and from Federation members and plus 50 trust to and from Federation members. Now, there's a bit of a gimmick or an exploit you can use to downgrade Federation ships and get free alloys out of it. That will be going away very soon if it's not already fixed. And so the only real benefit to this is that you can split one member off from the Federation, though it is tricky to do that, and attack them and steal their world. Getting a homeworld right at the start of the game is very powerful, but if you don't manage to pull off a quick successful war, Common Ground will leave you quite far behind. Shattered Ring also requires that you own the Federation's DLC. You will start on a specific type of homeworld, a Shattered Ring world. Your starting system also comes with two other sections of ruined ringworld that can be repaired once you have the mega engineering technology. There are a couple of massive drawbacks to this origin though. You will start with the ringworld preference on your species, meaning they will get 0% habitability on any planet other than a ringworld or a Gaia world. You also will have no guaranteed habitable worlds around you at the start of the game, so you are locked to a one world start. The Shattered Ring itself also has some issues. You will not be able to build any technicians or energy districts. That's a bit of a problem. You'll get trade districts instead, which can be used effectively. However, you will have to sink tradition points into the mercantile tree to get the proper benefit out of them. And that really locks you into one of the traditions right from the start of the game. And I don't feel that is very helpful. If you're a Gestalt Consciousness, you won't have this problem. However, every Empire type will not have mining districts. Instead, they will have Scrap Miners, which gives two minerals and one alloys as base production. That means you're going to have some mineral issues and the extra alloys really aren't worth it. The job efficiency here is pretty terrible. Life Seeded is very similar to the Shattered Ringworld, but it's actually slightly better and in some ways a little bit worse. In order to take this origin, you will need the Apocalypse DLC and your species will start on a Gaia world. This means they'll get all the benefits of being on a lovely size 30 Gaia world. So that's plus 10% happiness and plus 10% resource output. You can't really ignore that, it's pretty good but then you will not be able to settle any of these species on any worlds other than a Gaia world because you'll be at 0% habitability, which makes it really tough to expand in the early game. There are strategies for building up a single very good world and using that as a springboard to launch invasions of other empires and get their worlds, but overall I really feel this deserves its place down at the bottom of the list in the F tier because of all of the issues it brings up. Doomsday is something of a challenging origin that comes with quite a few limitations and unless you do some certain things to offset it, massive, massive penalties. In order to play with this origin, you will need the Federation's DLC. Now your home world will become a shattered world. That's right, it will explode within 35 to 45 years of the game's start. As your home world degrades, you're going to get doomsday modifiers, which will decrease stability, decrease habitability, and increase, these are the only benefits really, your energy, mineral and alloy production, which is quite nice. However, unless you're a machine intelligence, those will only really offset the penalties you're getting from the Doomsday modifier. As a machine empire, this could probably go in the B, possibly A tier, if you can manage to build up a massive, massive fleet and invade some other worlds before your own planet explodes. But being able to do that is rather challenging. And if you're enjoying this video, please give the like button a backstory. Also from Apocalypse, we have the post-apocalyptic origin. Your home world will start as a tomb world, that is the worst class of world, don't forget, and your species will get the survivor trait. Now, at the moment, none of the other worlds, your guaranteed habitable worlds, are tomb worlds, and there is no terraforming option to convert other worlds into tomb worlds, unless you count the Armageddon bombardment stance, which is, I suppose, terraforming via Exterminatus, 
but still, it isn't that great. You're not really going to benefit from the survivor trait hardly at all. Most of the worlds in any galaxy are not tomb worlds. If this was more specialized, it could be a little more niche and really quite nice if you could turn all of your worlds into tomb worlds and thus make them completely unpalatable and useless to any other alien empires. But without that being the case, I really don't feel you get any benefit at all from this origin. Now we're in the C tier. In my opinion, these origins do provide you with some bonuses, but generally they are a relatively neutral start. Or alternatively, the bonuses you're getting are basically neutral when you compare them to the other penalties from these origins. The Hegemon origin is very, very similar to the Common Ground origin, but it is a little better. Now, you're going to start with the Diplomacy Tradition Tree adopted and with the Federation Tradition, just like Common Ground. And just like Common Ground, you'll also need the Federation DLC. You will start as the president of a Hegemony Federation with two other members. The two members will be Xenophile and share at least one ethic with you, the president, but again, there will be no guarantee guaranteed habitable worlds regardless of the game settings. Now, this is slightly better than common ground because as a hegemony president, you can eject one of the members. You don't have to do some weird diplomatic shenanigans. You are guaranteed to be able to eject one of the Federation members and then fight them two on one. You'll have your fleet, your allies fleet and the Federation fleet. So it should be a rather easy war. And then you'll have two capital worlds as your starting worlds. And that's not terrible, but in order to do that, there are a whole host of hoops you have to jump through. So really, no, it's not that fantastic. The Mechanist Origin requires that you own the Utopia DLC. This is a rather interesting origin that used to be one of my favorites, especially back when it was a Civic many, many patches ago. Now it, however, has been eclipsed by the psionic version of it, Teachers of the Shroud, one of the new origins released with Stellaris Overlord. But I digress. What does it do? It starts you with the powered exoskeletons technology research and the robotic workers technology. You'll also get minus 5% upkeep from your robots. You'll start with a robot assembly plant and eight of your pops will be robots rather than the regular species. Now, the reason this isn't so fantastic is that it is pretty neutral. You can unlock powered exoskeletons technology and the robots technology within five to 10 years of the start of the game even if you are a little bit unlucky and then build a robot assembly plant. You get some robot pops at the start of the game which will have lower upkeep but overall they're basically the same as your regular pops so yes I don't really feel it's very powerful and it is in need of some love now that we've got some new origins that are competing with it. Syncretic Evolution also requires the Utopia DLC. With this one, you will start with a subservient secondary species. 12 of your pops will actually be this species and they will all get the Serviles trait. Now, the Serviles trait is pretty nice. It gives plus 10% happiness and plus 10% resources from jobs. However, none of these pops can ever be employed in ruler or specialist jobs and cannot generate governors or scientists. Now that we've got some other DLC that have been released after the Utopia DLC, the Serviles or Syncretic Evolution Origin feels pretty bland and underpowered as there are other origins that do the exact same thing pretty much, but do it more effectively and give you greater bonuses. Until the 23rd of May, Stellaris is free to play on Steam. Yes, that's right. If you'd like to try out this game, it is absolutely free this weekend. If you're enjoying this game and you're enjoying this and other videos on my channel and you'd like to support my channel, you can do so by following the link in the description to the Humble Bundle store and buying Stellaris, the Stellaris Overlord or any of the other Stellaris DLCs on the Humble page. Until the 24th of May, most of the Stellaris DLC are on sale on the Humble store. The Remnants Origin requires that you have the Ancient Relics DLC. Your Guaranteed Worlds will gain the Colonial Remains modifier when colonized. That's quite a nice modifier as it gives minus 25% building cost and minus 25% district cost, helping you establish your two first colonies at a slightly cheaper rate than other empires would be able to. And you'll also start with a size 22 Relic World. 
but this relic world does not behave like a regular relic world. It has all of the normal districts and to all intents and purposes, it's just a normal world. However, you do get five ruined arcology blockers, which will unlock random technologies and give you some minor artifacts when you clear them. And it will be a little easier to get an Ecumenopolis world because you won't need an Ascension perk to get there. You can simply upgrade the Relic world into an Ecumenopolis when you have the required technology. But overall, it is now a pretty neutral origin that doesn't give you that many bonuses aside from these ones we've talked about here. And for that reason, I really don't feel it deserves a place much higher than the C tier. Ocean Paradise requires the Aquatics DLC. This one will lock your species into having the Aquatic trait, which is a fantastic trait. And you will also start inside a nebula. You'll start with four frozen worlds and 10 ice asteroids. However, your guaranteed habitable worlds will also be frozen worlds, and that means you can't live on them. Your homeworld, and this is where the main benefits come from, will be a size 30 ocean world, and you'll start with the Ocean Paradise modifier. This is, in some ways, a little bit better than being a Gaia world. This modifier gives plus 15% happiness, plus 10% pop growth speed, and plus 5% resources from jobs. So you're trading a slight reduction in resource output for an extra 10% pop growth speed. The reason that this origin is here in the C tier and not all the way down there in the F tier is that your pops are not locked. Unlike the Gaia origin or Shattered Ring origin, you'll be able to colonize any type of wet world without any penalties. In fact, ocean worlds will be really good for you to colonize and you'll get some fantastic bonuses. Now we've made it to the B tier. Every origin in this tier offers some type of long-term bonus that will be with you throughout the game. And it doesn't give you a massive drawback or penalty for taking it right at the start. However, that doesn't make it quite as good as an origin from the A or S tier, but let's dive in and find out what's in B. On the Shoulders of Giants requires the Federation's DLC. You will start with a random home system planet that has the Ex Gravitas archaeological site. As you complete this site, more archaeological sites will be unlocked, and this will give you a steady supply of minor artifacts that can be traded for energy. As of the 3.3 update, we can only trade one of these minor artifacts every six months, and that's why this is stuck down here in the B tier, as it has been compressed slightly in terms of its effectiveness. On the other hand, in the mid game, you will get an event chain that should replace your Spurred by the Past modifier, a nice modifier that's going to give you some healthy bonuses at the end of the archaeological chain you completed right at the start of the game. That will be replaced with either the Full Circle or the Goes Around Comes Around. Now, they are to all intents and purposes pretty much the same, and they give you some lovely bonuses. These bonuses will help your Empire out right into the end of the game, so it is quite a nice event chain in total and gives you some quite nice things, the artifacts and the modifiers. Resource Consolidation is the only origin that requires you to have the Synthetic Dawn DLC. This is a machine intelligence specific origin and it will mean that your homeworld starts as a machine world there are a couple of blockers that mean it won't function at maximum efficiency right from the start of the game. However, you do start with all of your building slots unlocked, which cannot be understated in terms of its effectiveness, and it has no other ill effects. From a machine intelligence standpoint, this is quite a nice origin to have. Lost Colony is another origin that is included with the base game. An advanced empire with the same species as you will start with a random ethic somewhere in the galaxy. If the species portrait is human, the advanced empire will still use the Sol starting system. AI empires with this origin won't generate advanced empires if those were turned off. That's important to know as well. Now, you will start with the Colonial Spirit Homeworld modifier. This gives plus 10% happiness, plus 15% amenities, a nice plus 15% resources from jobs, and plus 10% habitability. Now, you need the habitability bonus because this world, even though it is your home world, your empire capital, will not start on a guaranteed 100% habitability. Most home worlds get a plus 30% habitability, putting them over the 100%, so you'll always start on 100% there. 
but you will only start on a minimum of 90% on your homeworld with this origin, as your true homeworld is out there somewhere else in the galaxy. Unlike the Prosperous Unification Origin, this Colonial Spirit Homeworld modifier will never go away, so you will always get this bonus on your homeworld, and I actually think that is rather powerful given it is a game-long effect. But what do you think about this Origins tier list so far? Let me know down in the comments below. For the first few hours after this video goes live, I will endeavour to read every comment and respond to as many as I can. Here be Dragon's Origin requires the Aquatic DLC. You start the game with an allied Sky Dragon Leviathan in your home system. This Sky Dragon is pretty darn powerful and can protect you from a lot of early game threats. You'll also get a living metal deposit within two hyperlane jumps of your capital. Now, there's a whole host of events that happen with this origin, and in the end, once you've completed an ascension path and unlocked four ascension perks, or no ascension path and unlocked six ascension perks, you'll be able to communicate directly with the Sky Dragon, take control of it, and then breed more dragons of your own. That could be very, very nice and powerful. It's quite a nice origin from a turtling perspective, and when combined with something like the Reanimator Civic, you could attempt to kill your Sky Dragon quite early in the game, and then resurrect it from the dead, and thus have a very, very powerful fleet in the form of an undead Sky Dragon as early as 2230. Calamitous Birth is an origin specific to only Lithoid species, and it does require that you have the Lithoid Species Pack DLC. Now, what does it do? You will start the game with a massive crater planetary feature on your capital. This makes your homeworld slightly bigger, getting plus six max districts and plus six max mining districts. However, you can't have as many agriculture districts. You get a minus six agriculture district penalty, but as a lithoid, you can basically ignore that. And you get a plus 25% pop growth speed, which will completely negate the minus 25% pop growth speed modifier you get for being lithoid. Generally speaking, Calamitous Birth will be negating the negative effects of being a Lithoid, which are mostly the pop growth related problems. You'll also start with the Lithoid Crater Homeworld modifier, which gives minus 50% habitability. And the last part is that you unlock the Meteorite Colony Ships. Now, these are special colony ships that require 500 minerals and nothing else, making them quite a lot cheaper than regular colony ships. They'll also build in half the time. Now, when you colonize a world with a Meteorite Colony Ship, it will put a Lithoid Crater modifier on that planet and two blockers, which can be cleared, giving you extra Lithoid Pops. A big part of the strength of this origin is that it will make your worlds basically uncolonizable for regular biological empires, as you have a plus 50% habitability modifier by being a lithoid, which will negate the minus 50% from the lithoid crater modifier, but regular biologicals cannot negate that effect. Subterranean is another new origin we have with the Stellaris Overlord DLC. Your species will get the Cave Dweller trait, this gives you a 50% species minimum habitability on every planet, however that cannot be improved. You'll also get plus 15% minerals from jobs, but on the flip side, you will lose 20% of your biological pop growth speed, and you'll get plus 10% empire size from all your pops. This origin also means that mining districts are uncapped. You can have as many of them as you want on every one of your worlds, up to your planet size, and each mining district will grant two housing per district, additional to the regular housing you'll get, and every three mining districts will unlock a building slot. But that's not all. You'll also get minus 75% orbital bombardment damage, which if paired with the unyielding or adaptability tradition trees, you can get that up to the maximum of minus 98% orbital bombardment damage reduction, meaning this origin is fantastic if you want to turtle. If you also play it as a lithoid, most of the negatives like that poor pop growth speed will be negated because the lithoids actually have a worse pop growth reduction anyway. Overall, this is an interesting origin, but you will find you're having some issues economically as your pop growth will be behind other empires. 
you may be a little surprised to see Void Dwellers down here in the B tier. Now I'm going to explain why I believe this is the case because there have been quite a few changes to the Void Dweller setup over the last few months and years, and I think they have slipped from their primary position in the A tier. Void Dwellers used to be very, very powerful in terms of origins. I don't think they're quite the same anymore. You will start with three worlds, not just one world, but three worlds, a size six habitat built over a research deposit, meaning you can build research districts, a size four habitat built over a mining deposit, it, and a size 4 habitat built over an energy deposit. You'll also start with an arcane replicator planetary feature on the capital habitat which will help you with some of the alloy upkeep needed for these worlds. All of your species will have the habitat preference meaning they will have 0% habitability on regular worlds. You'll also get the Void Dweller trait. Now Void Dweller is quite nice if you're living on a habitat but otherwise it's downright terrible. It gives plus 15% pop output on habitats, but you get minus 15% pop output on planets, minus 10% pop growth speed everywhere, and minus 30% pop happiness on planets. This means if you want to go on the aggressive and conquer anyone as a Void Dweller, you'll find it almost impossible to keep hold of the worlds you conquer unless you're doing some fancy tricks because your primary species will not make good overlords on those worlds. You also start with the Orbital Habitats technology researched, meaning you can make more habitats, and the Habitat Expansion technology unlocked, ready to be researched. If you're a regular biological empire, you'll start with hydroponics and eco-simulation technology, but if you're a lithoid, you'll get powered exoskeletons and zero-g refineries. All of your hydroponics farms also give you an extra farmer job. A massive problem with habitats at the moment is that they've reduced the number of amenities you're going to get from your politician jobs, meaning you're going to find yourself in an amenities deficit very, very early on. It might even be once the game has started, you'll need to start worrying about amenities straight away. Whereas with other empires, it's much less of an issue. Yes, as a void dweller, you can get quite a lot of trade value, but that's only if you start going down the mercantile tradition. So you're really locked into having mercantile tradition as one of your seven traditions if you choose this and want to get a nice large amount of trade value which I'd also recommend doing. Overall Void Dweller is not as powerful as it used to be and that's why it slipped down here to the B tier. Tree of Life requires the Utopia DLC and it's one of the few origins to be specifically for Hive Minds. You'll start the game with a Tree of Life sapling planetary feature now. This will give you a nice plus 10 housing, plus 15% pop growth speed, and plus 10% society research, along with plus four agriculture districts. It will cost four food upkeep and be destroyed if you have 50 devastation. On top of that, every colony you found will get a transplant of this sapling and that will give slightly less bonuses but still nice bonuses plus 10 percent pop growth speed plus five housing and plus 10 percent society research from jobs along with another plus two max agriculture districts any worlds without a tree of life planetary feature get minus 50 percent planet build speed minus 25 percent resources from jobs plus 10 percent upkeep from jobs and minus five stability so you really do need to keep these trees of life alive and that makes you a little bit vulnerable to orbital bombardment your colonies also cost less alloys they actually cost no alloys and cost just food instead costing i want to say a thousand food Tree of Life is an interesting origin that doesn't give you massive bonuses right at the start of the game, but over time it will give you fantastic scaling as a hive mind empire. You will be an economic powerhouse in the mid to late game, provided you survive that long. Wow, we've made it all the way up to the A tier. Um, this has been quite a lot. We've gone through a massive number of origins so far. If you've actually managed to make it this far and you're still with me, let me know down in the comment section below because you've really got very far through this video. Now these origins in the A tier are all really, really good. They are all pretty much meta picks, I'm going to say. A lot of competitive multiplayer is played with these origins, or I believe is going to be played with these origins. But what do we have? 
prosperous unification is the generic starting origin for basically all the empires. It is also one of the only origins that is not unique. Unlike all the rest of the origins you've seen so far, this one can be spawned in every single AI empire in the galaxy and therefore you're probably going to come across it again and again. But what does it do? Well, you will start with the planetary unification technology unlocked and ready to be researched. You'll also start with four additional pops, meaning you'll start the game with 32 pops if you're a regular biological empire, and you'll start with two additional districts. On top of that, your capital will get a nice bonus. You'll get the Prosperous Unification modifier for 20 years, giving you an extra 15% happiness, 25% amenities, and plus 10% resources from jobs. The long-term effect of having such a boosted start cannot be understated, as Stellaris is a game all about snowballing. A small advantage right at the start of the game like this can lead to massive advantages later on. This is also one of the most competitive origins that is not banned in multiplayer competitive games at the moment. Progenitor Hive is another hive mind specific origin, requiring both the new Overlord DLC and the Utopia DLC. This is, I believe, quite an interesting origin. Your leaders will be gaining experience each month as long as they're employed. You'll be able to construct offspring nest holdings and offspring nest buildings, which will give you some nice benefits and replace your spawning pools building. And unlike normal hive minds, you'll be able to release sectors as your subjects. You'll also have some interesting things when it comes to your fleet design. So your fleet will have a base minus 50% accuracy, evasion, ship fire rate, and sublight speed. However, that will be offset as long as you have some offspring ships in the fleet or you have the Offspring Outlook Starbase building built in the system, in which case you'll get a net 5% bonus to those previously mentioned statistics, or in the case of the Starbase building, a nice plus 15%. On top of that, with the menial drone output bonuses you'll get from the offspring nest building, you'll actually have a more powerful hive mind overall. Yes, if the homeworld is invaded or destroyed, you're going to get some big penalties that's minus 10% menial drone output, minus 30% sublight speed, and minus 10 stability, but you can enable the growing of a new progenitor on another world with that decision. All in all, I believe that Progenitor Hive is going to be the most powerful origin for your hive minds going forwards, as by the mid to late game, the extra bonuses here should put you head and shoulders above other hive minds, and on top of that, the bonuses you're going to be getting to your fleets should make them rather powerful from a military perspective, though you do have to worry about your offspring ships being killed or making sure you have offspring outlooks in your star bases. The Necrophage origin requires the Necroid DLC. This origin is basically a much, 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 much better version than the Syncretic Evolution. Your species will have the Necrophage trait, making them fantastic ruler or specialist class pops. And then you'll also get a secondary species, which you can specialize to be workers on your planet, a prepapent species, if you will. You'll also be able to construct the Chamber of Elevation buildings and use the Necrophage Purge type to purge alien pops into your primary species. Necrophage isn't as powerful as it used to be, as you do start with two guaranteed habitable worlds with primitive civilizations that are only advanced up to the Iron Age, meaning they will never have more than eight pops. Whereas in days gone by, they used to be possibly quite a bit larger. A necrophage empire leads itself quite well to conquest, as you're going to have everything set up quite perfectly to be the overlord or the ruling class of a number of other species across the galaxy. And if played correctly, necrophage is a fantastic meta origin. Imperial Fiefdom is the fourth new origin from the Stellaris Overlords DLC. This one's quite an interesting one. You'll start the game as a subject of an advanced empire at the prime of its life. Each galaxy size will spawn a vassal bordering the Overlord, so in a very large galaxy the Overlord should have more vassals, and the Overlord will also start with a size 30 Gaia world. If multiple empires have this origin, they'll all start with the same Overlord as well, which is cool for roleplay purposes. 
after a certain amount of time, the holy empire of whatever type it is will fracture and divide, and you'll be granted the option of having your freedom. Now, once they've fixed a lot of the balance issues, which they've done, I believe, with the new hotfix patch 3.4.3, and I believe we're going to get more fixes coming in that will further dampen the overwhelming power that we had with this Origin right at release, you'll still be completely protected as either a Scholarium, a Prospectorium, or a Bulwark by your advanced AI overlord into the mid game. This means you can scale up economically very efficiently without having to worry about any military matters. And for that reason, I think it easily deserves its position here in the A tier. Though I suspect in most multiplayer games outside of the roleplay theater, it is going to be completely banned. Now we are at the S tier. The origins in this tier are so good, so overwhelmingly powerful, that I believe they deserve a special place right at the top. Even then, I do think there is some differentiation amongst this tier. Two of these origins are again even more powerful than the third origin, but each of them has some very unique bonuses you will not be able to get elsewhere in the game. The Clone Army Origin was released with the 3.1 Lem patch. It is required to have the Humanoids DLC in order to play with this Origin. You'll be able to construct up to five ancient Clone Vat buildings, your species will have the Clone Soldier trait, and your Admirals will have the Clone Army trait. These give some pretty great bonuses respectively, but do stop your pops from being genetically altered in any way. Additionally, those clone vat buildings are going to provide a fantastic amount of biological pop assembly, meaning you can rush up to 100 pops very, very early in the game, giving you massive economic output. But if you lose any of those vats, your population will start to decline and die. There's also an archaeological chain that will spawn on your homeworld that will lead to a stark choice. Either you will go down the clone ascendancy or clone descendancy. With Clone Ascendant, you'll get absolutely phenomenal bonuses to your pops. That's both your specialist and ruler class pops will get massive bonuses to their output, meaning you can go out there and yes, you will only have a hundred pops, but you'll have a hundred pops that are 50% better than any other pops elsewhere in the galaxy, and every other empire will have less pops than you. The amount of fleets and science you'll be able to output with this origin is bonkers. And even if you have to go down the clone descendant path and you go for fertility instead, that's still really, really good. Playing with the clone army origin does require a little bit of finesse, but if done correctly, you are completely playing this game on easy mode. Right now, as a standalone origin, if there are no other empires in the galaxy, and the reason I say that is the next one does require some other empires to be around, but if there are no other empires in the galaxy, Clone Army is, in my opinion, the most powerful origin in Stellaris right now. Scion lets you start as the scion or the subject of a fallen empire, either a fanatic materialist or fanatic spiritualist empire. You'll also get a wormhole leading to the Overlord's capital system, and you'll gain powerful gifts every few decades from the Fallen Empire. A temporary Fallen Empire fleet every 20 years if you are losing a war against a superior empire, and it will always create a one-system Fallen Empire if the game was started with none. This basically means that whatever happens in Stellaris, you've got a big scary brother who has your back. It is the Imperial Fiefdom Empire origin on steroids, and that's why it is a phenomenally powerful origin. Generally, I wouldn't recommend you play with this origin as it takes away, in my opinion, a lot of the fun of the game Stellaris, because you'll have an AI empire that will step in whenever anything gets a little bit challenging. The last one here is the Teachers of the Shroud Origin. This is a new origin with the Stellaris Overlord DLC and does require that DLC in order to play with. Basically, what this origin does is it means that your empire starts with the latent psionic trait and it counts as having taken the Mind Over Matter Ascension perk. However, that Mind Over Matter Ascension perk does not fill up an Ascension slot. Yes, this locks you out of any Ascension path other than the psionic ascension, but that's no problem. 
because what this does is it guarantees that as soon as you have unlocked your third tradition tree and therefore third ascension perk, you can immediately take the transcendence ascension perk and complete your psionic path. On top of that, you'll be able to build things like the Psycor building on your planets, giving extra stability and extra resources from jobs as soon as you unlock the upgraded capitals. You'll also have the latent psionic trait, meaning you'll have psionic governors, admirals, scientists, and that is really quite a powerful extra thing to have. And finally, because we're not taking up one of those ascension perks to the mind over matter ascension perk, we do in essence have one additional ascension perk slot during the game. Yes, this origin gives you, and it's really, it doesn't say it, but it does, plus one ascension perks in total. And I think that means that Teachers of the Shroud does deserve its place up here in the S tier, as there is no other way in the game other than this specific origin of getting the effects of nine ascension perks. But how would you use the Teachers of the Shroud Origin to the maximum effect? If you'd like to know how I would run Teachers of the Shroud Origin, click the video on screen now.